Chapter 3, Virginia Has a Plan. For the next four months, delegates walked or rode each morning to the State House. Before going inside, they were stopped by prisoners begging at the jail just behind it. The prisoners would push their caps out the windows on long begging poles and insult any man who didn't drop in coins. The scene inside the grand two-story building was much more serene. The delegates met in the East Room. It was 40 foot square with a looming ceiling 20 feet high. Tall windows and two marble fireplaces graced the sides. Scattered about the room were tables covered in smooth green felt. James Madison always seated himself at the very front of the room, the prime spot to hear everything that was said. He decided to write down everything discussed in the debates. For the rest of the convention, he furiously scribbled notes, dipping his quill pen in and out of ink all day long. At night in his room at the inn, he carefully rewrote them. His important record of events became a treasure to historians. It's a special look inside, look into the framer's mind and what happened day by day. The convention's first order of business was to elect a chairman. Every single delegate voted for George Washington. Washington stepped to the front of the room and took his seat on a low platform facing everyone else. For the rest of the convention, he would say little. His job was just to keep the meetings on course. <clears throat> Next, the delegates set two important rules for themselves. First, they decided to keep their meetings secret. No one was to breathe a word about the convention outside the room, not even to family or friends. To enforce the rule, a guard was placed outside the door, and the windows were sealed shut. During the hot, steamy summer ahead, the framers sweated in coats and vests. The New England gentlemen wearing wool suffered the most. Still, the windows stayed closed. Why all the secrecy? The delegates wanted to speak their mind freely without worrying about anything landing in the newspapers. Second, the delegates set a rule that allowed them to change their mind on issues after a first vote. Some questions, such as a number of congressional seats per state, were so difficult that dele delegates needed to debate them over and over. After each debate, a vote was taken to see where everyone stood. But the votes weren't final. This system kept the delegates from leaving the convention when their side lost a vote. At different times, more than half of the men threatened to walk out. By sticking around, a man might still persuade others to his way of thinking and win the next vote. The real work of creating a new government began on the fourth day. James Madison had already written up a plan. He figured that the first one introduced would get the most attention. And he was right. Madison's voice was quiet and squeaky. So Madison asked another delegate from Virginia, Edmund Randolph, to deliver the plan. Randolph was Virginia's tall young governor. From then on, Madison's ideas became known as the Virginia Plan. The Virginia Plan called for three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial. The legislative branch, the Congress, was made up of elected members. It would make laws for the nation. Congress was to be split into two groups or houses, a bigger one and a smaller one. Today, the bigger house is called the House of Representatives and the smaller house is the Senate. The executive branch, headed by some kind of president, would carry out the laws, and the judicial branch, head by, head, led by the Supreme Court, was to interpret the laws, deciding whether or not they were fair. What was the point of having three branches? Madison thought that, with different duties spread out, no single branch could ever seize too much power. The other branches would be able to step in and stop that from happening. This system of controls is now known as checks and balances. When Randolph finished reading the Virginia plan, no one seemed to it set, at least not until he explained that the plan in his own way. Randolph used the explosive word national. Soon his meaning sank in. 
a national government would undercut the power of the states. In the Congress that the Articles of Confederation set up, members had to answer to state governments. Utter silence fell all over the room when Randolph sat down. One long minute passed, then another. As delegates sat stunned, only a few of them had considered creating a new national government. Most came to the convention expecting to revise or change the Articles of Confederation, not scrap them altogether. Finally, the silence broke and the arguing began, and it wouldn't stop for weeks. This is the end of chapter three.